Hello and welcome to a Think Piece Bits bonus section where all the leftovers that couldn't fit in the original Think Piece podcast episode all come to here. Which today I will have a special treat for everyone. All right, so we today have two special articles in store for everyone. First up is my Trip Lifesavers and Surprising Gems article and History, a tool or lesson, a specifically special article that I wrote in the very beginning days of my think piece. So shall we begin? Jumping off of our first article, Trip Lifesavers and Surprising Gems. So I wrote these as I was traveling across Southeast Asia and as my experiences grew per place I ventured into, I come to learn quite a bit of what I really needed compared to what I thought I had needed prior to my trip traveling, which is to say I learned really quick what I really needed and what also came in handy from my previous research uh, prior to the trip. And sometimes when we're packing or preparing for a trip, we overthink or overestimate or the worst case scenario, we underestimate and We truly don't value what we really needed. And sad to say, it's better to have it and not need it, but then, you know, as opposed to need it and not have it. At the same time, if you're backpacking or traveling like I was, you really needed to travel light. So you're in that pickle where you got to make the compromise between, you know, either something you need or something you don't need and you got to come to the compromise to well oh okay i need this but do i really need it you know you think you need it but in reality you don't it's just extra extra stuff you carry along with you so i come up as i travel along i learned through experience and just simply things i never really you know didn't need that i had brought along so then i started discarding it So I come up with this list in order to simplify that process for anyone and everyone that could or would need it. And also for for a reference for myself later on in future travels. Because, yeah, if I had this prior, it might have helped me a great deal of what I needed and needed to take with me, what is beneficial, or also some of the things that may get taken up by customs as you venture along in your journeys. But... I had always researched and prepared so that would not have happened or would not happen. But nevertheless, beginning with things that I needed and I had a tendency to use a lot in a travel. First one up is a skincare cream, which would not necessarily surprise you, but considering me, I have very sensitive skin and also sometimes I have a tendency to find and get cuts on me randomly or I might injure myself or get a rash or something like uh you know just rubbing my skin is rubbed raw like on your pants or something if you're hiking a lot or simply any and every little nook and cranny that could happen to you you know or even you know if you're wearing a flip-flop and you know where where it leads into your in between your toes and that area rubs raw after a while, because your feet are not necessarily used to it, this Neon Sporn is what it's called. It's a skincare cream that is tiny in a little package, kind of expensive sometimes, but it's so tiny you can just pack it in any of your travel boxes or any of your travel bags, and it's just perfect. It's perfect for everything. I used it for, you know, everything from bug bites to just basic skin problems, rashes, you know. Again, it is just, it's perfect. Just one of the most diehard items I have ever come across and needed. Multiple times I would use this on anything and everything. Like I said, it works perfectly. Burns, cuts, rashes, you rub something, you know, your skin's rubbed raw between your pants. Specifically, imagine, you know, if you're hiking a lot, again, this has happened to me, you know, you have a certain part on your pants or your belt or, you know, you got skin that's rubbing against each other and it's just, it's rubbed raw by the end of the hike and you're just sitting there like in agony at that night, at the night, you're sitting in your bunk or wherever you're crashed at and you're just like, oh my goodness, this is just painful because the next day is just going to be torturous when you walk or move around a lot. But you rub some of the stuff on your skin, any part that is bothersome or is a problem, boom, by the next day, kid you not, this stuff 
makes your skin just 100% better. The rash is gone. The skin is healed. Not 100%, obviously, but, you know, more significantly more than what it was. And it's not a lotion. I don't like lotions. I don't like anything that leaves a grimy aftertaste feel, you know, that little, the little gristle or just a little... You know, just a little slime it feels like to me afterwards. But you rub the stuff, rub it all on you, or rub it all over the spot area, and you rub it in good, boom. You, you know, for a first hour maybe, it stays on, but after a while it just soaks in, and it's, you know, it also doesn't stick to your clothing very much. Like, in the sense of, you know, you have lotion that sticks to your clothing, and then when you, you know, move it or something, it takes the lotion off the skin and all that jazz. Well, this stuff really is good for not getting stuck on clothing in that sense or making your clothing stick to you like glue. So that is something I learned and truly appreciated bringing on any of my trips, especially if you're a hiker or you're active. Those things are paramount. Even if you're not, if you're simply doing minor minute things, moving around, you're bound to get a cut. You're bound to get a scrape. You're bound to rub something raw. You're bound to like wear, like I said, where you wear the flip flops that go in between the toes and boom, you know, you're, you're in between your toes. You get the rubbing spot there. Perfect for that. Or if you have a strap that goes on your skin, you're at the beach all day and you wear it for most of the day or something you know, boom, you're good. If you even get a small sunburn on small on your nose, if you're walking or your ears, rub that stuff on there helps tremendously. You may not cure it completely, but it does help. Now, moving on to another section that's actually different because sometimes we're researching and we listen to other people's, you know, aspects of what their travels were like. And, you know, sometimes it's good to take in advice from others. And then there's sometimes you're like, okay, well, that, that doesn't really pertain to me and really was a waste of time. And X, that extra space would have saved me tremendously. But something that, you know, it really depends on how you travel. But for me, I learned quickly that carrying six plus pairs of socks was just, I rarely, rarely needed it. I mean, I did everything. But the where I was traveling at too was you know they're 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 perfect for footwear covering the foot inside in a closed shoe, you know I seem to I everywhere I was reading you know it says bring socks you gotta bring socks you can never have too many keeping your feet dry you know all these things says you know you're just you're gonna have a lot of problems you know because they they're assuming that you know a lot of these people had had issues with dry feet you know. Yeah, and honestly, I personally did not have so much of that happen. I know athlete's foot can happen really bad, but, you know, it just also involves you, you know, if you're going to be going out doing something that involves, you know, uh, waterworks or any of that sorts, I always tended to just bring flip-flops or sandals, anything that was exposed toe to events. And, you know, sometimes that's not good, you know, if you want to go to do something or even like swimming shoes, those are absolutely perfect because, you know, you're not going to wear any other shoe in there and you don't need a sock for it. But for me, I, for my personal self, I noticed three pairs of socks were perfect in the sense of, that was a week's work. By the end of the week, I would be washing clothes anyway. Three pairs of socks were significantly enough for me for six months, which you might say to yourself, what? Well, yeah, if you're washing every week or maybe even bi-weekly, three pairs of socks can go a long way. I mean, that also is including the fact that I wore sandals or flip-flops a lot. And where I was in summer weather and tropical weather, yeah, my feet in thick shoes were just miserable. I was sweating profusely. My socks quickly got sweat bound and it was just an unpleasant experience. And that's where I learned sandals and flip flops were perfect. And most of the time I, if I had the opportunity, I was barefoot and my feet got acclimated to the ground for the most part. Obviously concrete is not the way to go. And also you gotta be cautious about barefoot being barefoot and sandals and flip-flops, but at the same time, you know, it's it's something to consider when you're walking or using footwear. You always have to be cautious about your feet in every aspect of travel because 
the moment you lose your foot in the sense, not like gone, your foot's gone. I mean, like you injure your feet somehow or another, you're just in pain and the whole trip is not pleasant. Fun fact, these stories correlate with one another because when I was wearing my flip flops at one point, I had injured, somehow injured or got a nick on my toe. And I was just devastated because like my foot had this nick on it and I was walking. If you've been to Southeast Asia, you know some of the cities you're walking into, the the ground is absolutely questionable. Just absolutely questionable. You get a slight nick on your foot or something like that, you're just asking for problems. But this is where I had the neon sporn. And I got a Band-Aid, obviously. I put some Neon Sporn the night of, like, after I found out my, I got my nick. And when I went to bed, I put it on my foot, put a Band-Aid on it. And literally, could you not, like, it sealed it and it got it healed in, like, two or three days. I had a scab over it and I was perfectly fine. I had a solid scab. Not like kind of scab that, like, you know, you pull and then that the next day it's just, you're, you're, you have a blood on it. No, it was, like, nearly next day I had almost full-on scab and it was Rare, I was raring back to go. So it's one of those events where, yeah, socks are great for events like that. Or if you're doing hiking, intensive hiking, now that's different. You know, always I absolutely say shoes are the way to go for that sort of stuff. But for me, day-to-day hiking, it worked out fine. And, you know, obviously I wasn't doing two or three day hikes at the same time. I was doing more or less day hikes. And so it worked out perfectly in that sense but I realized that many socks six plus pairs of socks wasn't good for me but I highly recommend depending on whatever activities you are going to do or participate while you're traveling look at it and engage okay how often do I normally change my socks when I'm hiking at home or when I'm hiking doing camping or when I'm doing these things Based off of that assumption and based on how many times or how long you're going to be somewhere, that's how I would evaluate it. For me, I overestimated thought, thinking six pairs of socks for six or plus socks, you know, six plus or more socks, pairs of socks was going to be enough for me for six months. When in reality, I found flip flops and I never looked back. <laughs> it was simple as that. But, you know, these are the things that. I had thought, oh man, these are absolutely critical for any of my trips. And they are. They are always going to be critical for my trips. But some are more critical than others. And also it's evaluation how much is more critical than the other. Needless to say, this first one, I kept it short. Because one, I was coming up with more and I was thinking. But I was like, hey, I really wanted to tell you more. And wanted other people to hear about it. So, needless to say, that was it for the first of my tips and tricks. But, luckily for everyone else, or maybe not, I wrote five or six more of these little tidbits and little, uh, little, uh, vice. Little gems. Little gems of the traveling world, needless to say. Thanks, guys, for tuning in and listening to my podcast. If you are interested, I have an assortment of all kinds of cool shirts, t-shirts, everything from tank tops, hoodies, I got masks, I got maps, and all sorts of cool designs that I think you would enjoy. So if you enjoy my channel and want to find a way to support, go check out my store down here in the link below. Moving on to our next topic history a tool or a lesson history is a set of lies agreed upon by men once quoted by napoleon bonaparte today there are many historians including myself who either love the man or hate him he embodies the ideal individual who rose from nothing to prominence or the tyrant who ended the revolution and then systematically rolled back the hard-won freedoms of the people and developed the modern police state. Neither idea is completely right or wrong in viewing the man, but the fact that both can be interpreted as potential truths of history is the most important takeaway. History is essentially the study of the past. From the very first histories or what we would consider written history, called the histories, written by the Greek 
Herodotus, the subject has developed and morphed into many forms. It has either been used at the behest of the state to create an identity and legitimacy, or in the truest intention, a chronicle of humanity's past, where we came from and what we've achieved. A textbook definition of history. It's the study of past events, particularly in human affairs. The word originated from the Greek words histor, meaning learned wise man, and historia for finding out narrative history. It has not changed drastically over the years in its meaning, though it has changed our view of human existence drastically. Imagine if the only history we had were runes and archaeological findings of Germanic and French tribes of Europe, instead of the many writings and relics of Roman antiquity. How drastic of a change in our national narrative could you envision the United States taking on? Well, for the obvious ones, the marble columns and the Senate would be the first things to be noticeably different in this new American narrative. History has many sayings. One in particular I have often heard is, history is written by the winners. While it has a kernel of truth to it, it isn't always the fact. A few cases come to mind that challenge this notion. The history of Napoleon is a classic one, a story of a man who is defeated by the combined European powers, yet he is one of the most recognized names and symbols of military prowess in all of Western and world history to this day. Another is the narrative of the American Civil War. If you ever pick up an American public school history book, it often incurs that the war was fought over a completely different goal than the retaining of the slavery system that was in widespread use in the southern states, king cotton economies, or about the atrocities the South was committing in order to retain state rights, as some books call it. Events and periods such as these bring up the point of how history is used as a tool for creating a false narrative that covers up the truth of humanity's past, when in reality we should own up to our own mistakes, accept uncomfortable truths, and teach our future generations how to not commit the same failures as our forefathers. Even with the potential to be manipulated in negative ways, history is absolutely vital to the security and continued success of the human species. Its importance is rival to developing one's common sense and critical thinking skills. No one should be without basic knowledge of their past and heritage, whether it be national or local. With this sort of view, you may already be a novice, historian, or history buff yourself. Suppose you know automobiles, from the history of the detailed parts onward. Even if you only know the stories you were told by your parents and grandparents, those are records of a past, a form of history. The difference really is how you utilize that knowledge. Most history in classes is taught with the primary focus on memorizing dates, battles, and events, but never truly engaged in or explaining the importance of why or even the common people of the time. History has always been such a fascinating topic of study. Unlike other fields, history focuses on what humanity has already done, showing where we have been and how that leads us to the present. It also made me acutely aware of the type of future we are barreling towards. The feeling of constant deja vu when what you, you've you studied in a history book reappears in your daily news feed with all the identical red flags of years past. Yet those around you are at times willfully ignorant, either having no understanding or even the slightest knowledge of their footsteps, leading down the identical paths of their predecessors from years or even centuries ago. Truly, it is our responsibility as humans to educate ourselves on not only the past, but the present actions of our world and where our lives are headed. Logically, you would not buy a car or a house without taking some time to research loans, home ownership, insurance, and consult experts in the field. So why would you look at politics, governance, and history and say, ah, well, I know, I don't need to know more. What makes one more important than the other? Don't the laws of the land affect your lived experience a great 
deal more than most other things. A law or a politician is crafted out of their history and out of the history of the previous laws and government. They follow the same trajectory. These people then assume the power, awesome power of not only deciding our lives and freedoms, but what is taught to our generations for years to come. The scope of history can be as large or as small as you want or need it to be, but history changes. By the course of time, information, those in power, or by the lack of accountability, it will be altered. One saying that remains at the very core of history. If you do not learn from history, you are doomed to repeat it, whether it is for good or bad. And that's a wrap for this Think Peace Bits episode number three. I hope you enjoyed the content that I've provided as much as I did creating it. And I hope you will continue to come and visit me on my channel, on my podcast, on my YouTube channel. And if you haven't already, you should absolutely subscribe to my newsletter. And any other support is always welcomed because I can't do this without your help. And I do this for the sake of everyone else around me. So I hope you've enjoyed again this episode and I hope you come back again looking forward to whatever content I have decided I'm going to throw out here. <laughs> so again, thank you once more for your continued support and I look forward to hearing from every one of you 